Happy New Year, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be joining us from today. Welcome to today's webinar, co-hosted by the New York Oracle User Group and Oracle partner Viscosity North America. We're here to kick off a new year with a bang. We've got a full virtual house today, which is super exciting for Better Designed Than Sorry, Let's Design Our Database Schema, presented by Liron Amitsi. My name is Monica Lee, and I'm the Marketing Director for Viscosity. We are a full Oracle stack consulting firm with core expertise in Oracle database, including Rack, Apex. We do zero downtime migrations, performance tuning, um, high availability, and we've got decades of experience with infrastructure, including engineered systems. Lately, we've been upgrading a lot of our customers to Oracle Database 19C, and we'll actually be hosting a series of 19C workshops with the National Oracle User Group, OD Tug. Um, so we'll have one workshop a month leading up to their um, annual conference in June, and that's called K-Scope. If you're not familiar with it, it's great. Check it out. Um, and our first workshop is actually next week about 19C new features on the 14th. So if you're interested, let us know. During today's webinar, uh, feel free to submit questions to our presenter, and you've got a questions or chat prompt on the lower right-hand side of your screen. He will look at it throughout the webinar, so just you know, ask away, <laughs> and we'll have a little time at the end as well, so feel free to use that time um, and your resources with Liron today. So representing NYOUG, I've got Coleman Leviter. He's going to tell you a little about a little bit about NYOEG and then introduce you to Liron. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar series hosted by uh, Viscosity. And thank you, Monica. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the New York Oracle Youth Group. Uh, we were established in 1984 for the exchange and ideas for Oracle software products. Uh, you can connect with us on Twitter, Meetup, LinkedIn, Facebook, or of course our website at nyoug.org. And you can also outreach to our members using the Oracle Community User Group Board. And that's also on our website as well. All the links you can find at nyoug.org. And I wanna thank Viscosity for hosting these series of webinars that we work with them uh, very closely on. And I just did like to introduce Liron. Liron is an Oracle ACE director and senior Oracle DBA consultant with more than 20 years of experience. During his years, Liron worked as a senior consultant with a large number of companies in various fields and managed an Oracle professional services team. He mainly specializes in high availability solutions, performance, backup and recovery, and other infrastructure and application database areas. <clears throat> Liron is the president of the British Columbia Oracle Use Group and he's a well-known instructor and lectures in Oracle courses, events, and forums. Thank you again, Laurent, and thank you, Monica, and Viscosity for hosting these series uh, with New York Oracle Users Group. Okay, thank you, Coleman, and thank you, Monica. Uh, and hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Liron, as uh, Coleman and Monica said. Um, and good morning, good afternoon. Um, today we're going to talk about database design and I call this session Better Design Than Sorry. Uh, on the screen, you should be able to see my screen now. Um, you have my contact information if you want to be in touch, my email and my Twitter account and my website. Uh, it will be at the end as well if you want to you know, follow me, get in touch or anything else. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. I, I, maybe I should add that. To my presentation. Um, okay, so let's start. A little bit about myself. Um, so I'm originally from Israel, which is the small, I don't know, purplish area here in the Middle East. And uh, just over five years ago, me and my family, we moved all the way to the other side of the world. Uh, and we live in Vancouver in BC in Canada now. Uh, so this is where I I am here, I am now, and uh, it's 9 a.m. here. It should be in New York at uh, 12 p.m., uh, but it's closer. Um, and 
I've been a DBA since Oracle 7 in 1998. Most of this, uh, my career, I've been an, an Oracle consultant and here in Canada, I'm a, I'm a senior database consultant. I'm, uh, I'm independent. I'm working with uh, all kinds of different companies or clients here in, in Canada and the US and, and some back in Israel. I have my own website. Uh, go to dba.com. I have a, a blog there that is mostly technical, um, it, but not only. I have some other resources as well. I have my presentations there. I have some uh, a few scripts. I have uh, a series about uh, becoming a consultant and all kind uh, of soft skills stuff as well. Uh, so you're welcome to go there and, and check it out and uh, subscribe if you'd like. And I'm also very involved in the in the Oracle community. I'm an Oracle Ace director, and I've been a part of the Oracle Ace program since uh, 2009. And as Coleman said, I'm um, here in Vancouver. I'm uh, the president of of the British Columbia Oracle User Group. Uh, so that's about me. And let's start with the session. So the goal today is basically to open your mind, okay? There are all kinds of different sessions and all kinds of different topics to talk about schema design. Um, my goal here is not to talk about the technical aspects on, <clears throat> sorry, on how to do that or, or why to do that, uh, but to open your mind to all kinds of different options uh, and the pros and cons of everyone. So this session will basically be divided into two parts. The first part will be a very general review about schema design, what it includes, um, how, stuff like that. And then the second part will be, um, we'll take one example of um, um, a challenge, let's say, or a requirement, and then we'll see how we can design the same problem, how can we design it in different ways and what the pros and cons of each way. So the goal again is just open your mind to different designs uh, because many people are locked into a specific design when they uh, have this these need to design a, a new schema or, or a new application. And I just want to show you that there are all kinds of different options and in different times you will need different, different designs. So, what is the what are the goals of schema design first of all the database that we have the goal is the of the database is to store and retrieve data okay so you need to design your schema in order to do that okay and in some cases i can design a schema that you know we can store everything we want but we won't be able to to retrieve it it will be too complex to you know write the queries to to retrieve the data or it will be too complex or maybe uh we will need um the other way around it will be very easy to retrieve the data but the way that we need to insert it or process it before inserting it into the database will be too complex or you know a messy a messy process so the first thing that we need to remember is the database is there in order to be able to store our data and retrieve that. So we will have to design the schema that the application will be able easily enough to store the data there or insert the data and then query it. The next thing is data integrity. In some cases, uh, data integrity is like top priority. Okay. Um, in other cases, maybe not. So data integrity is something that you will need to figure out how important it is and and how to do that okay and again in some requirements or, or in some designs uh data integrity will be easier to implement in some it will be very difficult so we will need to consider that as well performance okay in some cases again some designs will be able to uh insert tons of data uh, very, very quickly. But then back to the, the first point, we'll need to figure out how to retrieve that, okay? Or, you know, some some uh, applications will need to insert a huge amount of data very quickly and querying it will be a, a different problem or a different uh, case later on. Uh, some will need to, you know, mo have moderate performance with the insert, but then they will require to querying very quickly. So we need to think about uh, performance as well when we design the schema because some designs will allow better performance in some cases and, and worse performance 
in other cases. And the last thing is flexibility, okay? So when we design a schema, we have these four things, and basically the important thing is that uh, we need to match the design that we build to the application requirements. And application require, uh, application, applications have different requirements, and different requirements will lead to different designs. And this is what I'm, I'm going to show you today, okay? So flexibility uh, is one of the things that we need to think about, how uh, strict or flexible my data or my design is. What is schema design? What it includes? So it includes data types and values and indexes and tables, structure and normalization and constraints and triggers. Okay, so these are the four, let's say, building blocks, and we'll and we'll in the in the first part of this presentation we'll dive a little bit into each one. So let's start. Data and data types. So I have a table here with four columns: ID, just the primary key of the of the table, and then city the low temperature date and the low temperature in Fahrenheit. This is real data, um, by the way. So in Vancouver, for example, in 68, we had zero uh, degrees Fahrenheit. In New York, the lowest temperature was recorded in 79 and it was minus 52 degrees. However, you can see two different, two strange things here. First of all, all the uh, columns here are Varkar, okay? So this is data types that we talk about. So city is obviously Varkar, but how about low temperature date or low temperature, um, the, the low temperature itself, the temperature value? Um, so this is this is one problem. And the, the other one is this. This obviously is not the correct date and obviously not the correct temperature, right? So I've seen in many cases that uh, applications use, I'll start with the top one, uh, the, application, uh, the applications use invalid values or um, yeah let's say invalid values in order to represent uh, unknown value okay so if I don't have the information for Tel Aviv I'll just put you know January 1st 9999 and the low temperature will be minus 9999 obviously these are not uh, valid values so that would be uh, in my application that will be regarding regard as um, I don't have this information okay unknown um so we'll start with that there is a, a null value in the database right so i've seen applications don't use null values and use invalid values uh, instead and this is the problem okay so this might be might lead to performance problem and the optimizer uh regard that it doesn't know that this is invalid value there is a year 9999 and there is a number minus 9999 right so um so oracle will the, the optimizer might be confused about that okay the distributions of values and stuff like that so that might lead to performance problem also if there is another application that now connects to this table for querying they might not know that this is how you handle that okay so if you are using like by design you decide that invalid values will represent something maybe think about that twice usually the best um, the best thing to do would put null in the in the value now for the bo bottom uh, issue as you can see the low temperature date and the low temperature uh, the uh, f the fahrenheit uh, are varkar as well and this is also a problem because first of all when you enter a date and a number as varkar the order is not correct Right. If you look at Varkar ordering, um, then A will be before AB, and then B will be after. So it's the same with numbers. Okay, 12 will be before 20, right? Um, but the problem is that 205, for example, will be before 13. Okay, uh, sorry, before 21. Okay. Uh, so ordering of numbers and ordering of text is completely different. So if you represent numbers er, as varkars in the database, if you if you store them as varkars in the database, ordering will be messy. Okay. 
as well as uh, again optimization because the optimizer knows how many values there are between 13 and 14. In number cases, if it's integers, it will be only 13 and 14. But if it's text, then 132, for example, 133, 13257 will all of them be between 13 and 14. Okay, so ordering and uh, the distribution of values, that's a mess when, when you try to uh, force storing numbers as varchar and storing dates as varchars. Okay, um, and this is a problem with optimization. There are lots of information about out there, uh, blogs, po blog posts, and other information about these things. So I don't want to get into that um, more than I already said. But again, when you design a schema, you need to be very careful about the data types and the actual values that you want to put in your tables. Another example about that is uh, a case that I, I had a real scenario about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And they had a table, let's call it event, and they had year, month, and date. And each one of them was Varkar 10. So that's a problem, we said that already, but let's assume that this is what it is. This is what we had. So what they kept in the database was the year, was 2020, the month was 2020 minus 01, like January 2020, and then the day was the 1st of January 2020, okay? So there also was a duplication of data between the columns, okay? And the problem that we had then, and it was, again, 15 years ago, it was Oracle 9, if I remember correctly, we had a huge optimization issue here, okay? Because of the cardinality that the, the optimizer calculated, we had a huge problem because if you look at the year, month, and day, you would expect to see the year 2020, the month 01, and the day 01. But the fact that the month included the year and the day included the month, that was a, a mess with the optimizer. Okay, so we, we did have a performance problem there. Um, and also, I talked about integrity. So think about what happens if the application messes things up and the year is 2020, but the month is 2019 01. Okay, so this is a this is a problem that you have data integrity or consistency here within the table, um, and it, that might lead to all kinds of different problems as well. The next topic uh, will be indexes. So I'm I'm not going to get into indexes because this is this is a topic by itself. Uh, but when you design a schema, um, you will need to think about indexes as well. If you're gonna go with B tree indexes and bit pump indexes, indexes uh, based on their you know pros and cons of each one and, and limitations, and then if you have composite index um, index on on more than one columns, which column is the first and which one is the second and so on. This is really important in some query scenarios, and then maybe function based index if you need. But the the topic of indexes I think is the probably the least important here when you design a schema because first of all indexes especially in oracle can be changed online okay so you can drop indexes you can add indexes everything is online no downtime it's quite flexible um but this is something that you you do need to you know keep in your in your mind when you design a schema uh also how many indexes the, the more you have, the more load or overhead you have when inserting or updating or deleting the, the um, values from the rows from the tables, uh, but it improves queries, okay? So you need to think about that and the trade-off as well. And last thing, with, with Oracle, we talk about autonomous DB, and with autonomous DB, we have automatic indexes. So maybe in the future, at one stage, we won't need to worry about that as well, at all, and Oracle will just, you know, create and delete indexes on the fly for us. Um, but for now, we still, it, even with this feature, it, it's it's a bit limited still, and and we need to um, design the indexes or think about the indexes ourselves. Okay, the next topic is table normalization. Okay, so we have uh, just an example here. Again, a table normalization is something that you know people 
uh, learn in university. There are courses in university about that, and and there are full sessions uh, only about normalization. So I'm not going to dive too much into that, but just as an overview, we have a, a table of employees here with the name, department, city, and state. And uh, the concept of, of normalization is just separate the entities. So here, the department name, we have the department name, okay, IT or sales. Normalization means that we're going to split that into a different table. And now we have departments and we have employees and there is a relationship between them. And the benefit of that is that in the department table, now I can add more information. I can add the the address or you know the manager of this specific department if i if i didn't split that into a different table i had to duplicate this data in the employee table and this doesn't make sense okay i can do the same with the city and state okay and just keep uh, id for a city and then the city is uh the the city's table will be uh, the city ID and the city and the state. You can do that the same with the states or you know any way you you'd like. One of the major benefits of table normalization uh, there are there are a few, uh, but one of one of the things is um, an example with a, a city called Grover City that in 1992 in California they decided to change their name to Grover Beach. So now all the employees that I have in the employee table that live in Grover City, now we need to change their city name to Grover Beach, right? So with the, with the unnormalized table, I had to go and update the entire employee table. This would lock all the rows, it will take time and so on. With the cities table, with the normalized, I have this city only once, right? I have the ID and the IDs uh, is in the employee table. And now I have the city name only once in the cities table. And I the, in, in the second, the bottom example here, I update the cities table, just one row, it doesn't affect the employee table. Okay, there are, again, there are uh, many other differences, many other benefits of, of um, normalizing the data. For example, if I want a city list, to get a city list from the cities table is really easy unlike get the city the city's list from the employee table so these are again just uh, um, a short taste let's say about thermal table normalization and the last thing is constraints and triggers okay so if we want to enforce uh, we talked about flexibility and data integrity so if we want to enforce specific data types and values for example we have i don't know temperatures and we want to have a specific limit on the temperature, or we have, um, I don't know, um, a gender and it's a few different values or something like that, or a state, and we have a list of values. Uh, so we can enforce that so people won't enter values that we, we don't want them to enter. And then we can enforce parent-child relationship. So we will make sure that if we have, let's say the department stable, and we have the department manager that the manager will be an actual employee of the of the um, company so a parent child relationship that's something that we, we can enforce with constraints and then uniqueness and, and not null values and stuff like that and if we need some more complex scenarios we can do that with triggers okay so we can keep the integrity of the data uh, in the database and just to sum it up Again, this is a very simplified example. And if you have some experience with the OLTP and data warehouse um, uh, environment, it will sound um, familiar. So as a general rule, again, there are always exceptions, but as a general rule, um, if we divide the classic um, applications to, into two uh, different type of applications, OLTP, online transaction processing, and data warehouse, um, the rules will be again as a general rule for saving space usually in oltp we will we will we will, we will want sorry to avoid duplicates and then um in data warehouse usually data warehouse have much more space available and these these uh the, the data is is not updated hardly okay so we don't care about duplicates so much because we 
won't need to change that as well. Data integrity in OLTP is more important. We don't want, you know, data coming from all kinds of different applications or user input on some, something like that. We need to be very strict with data integrity. Data warehouse is usually getting data from other systems. So if they keep, keep their data integrity, we are usually good. And also data is not changing. So we can validate the data on the way in. And once it's in there, we don't need to verify it because it doesn't change. Um, normalization, usually in OLTP, we will normalize. Uh, in data warehouse, we will denormalize. Okay, so basically, we'll do the opposite. We'll get the these um, uh, entities, the the side entities, the small entities, into the big tables, um, usually for performance and reports purposes. Uh, contention in OLTP, we have multiple users changing data all the time. So we would like to avoid contention as much as possible and work on on very small pieces of data. In data warehouse, it's irrelevant. Mostly, uh, there are a few processes that get the data in, and usually most of the users just query. Uh, and performance in OLTP, we would like an instant report, a response. If we uh, have a website and we click on something, we have an application, we you know we click on something, we we open a screen, we want that to be instant. In data warehouse, usually these are reports. Reports, you know, can run for a long time and without any problem. So the concept here is that the design will be different between OLTP and data warehouse, and the requirements will be different between OLTP and data warehouse. Okay, if you go to a, a person that works with OLTP system and you tell them, okay, when you click this button, it will take you like um, a minute to open, they will say, oh, you're crazy. One minute is unacceptable. And with data warehouse, if you tell to a person that works with data warehouse, you click this, you know, open report, and this report takes like 10 minutes to to process. He said, "No, oh, okay, that's fine. I will wait, and maybe we'll do that asynchronously, and he will be or they will be able to continue working on the application, and the report will get later on or in the email or anything like that." Okay, so the requirements are completely different in some cases. And the design will be completely different in uh, some cases. Okay, so this was the first part of the presentation. Again, it was a very general overview. Um, if you have any questions, again, like Monica said, you can put that in the in the Q and A or the chat boxes, and they are open. I have two monitors here. It's open on the other monitor, so um, I'll I, I'm I'm peeking on that as well, uh, so I can answer. Um, okay, so let's go to the second part. The second part is let's design a schema. Okay, so I'm going to present you a requirement or a scenario, if you will, um, and let's design this schema together. It's it's you know it's an online event and not not in person, unfortunately, uh, but I'll do my best. So the requirement is a software for uh, a company called Books and More, and again, very simplified. They have, uh, it's a, a chain of stores, let's say, and it they have um, three types of products. They have books, they have magazines, and they have audio CDs. Books have, all, uh, all of them have some um, properties that we need to keep in the database. Okay, so books have author, title, date, number of pages, and, and price. Magazines have publication, title, date, frequency, and price, and so on. Um, and as you can see, we have three properties here that are common between all three products. And then each product has uh, two unique properties as well. Okay. So how would you design this table? Okay. I'll give you, I don't know, a minute to think about that. How are you going to uh, build the table, tables and how many tables and stuff like that. When you think about the tables, just leave out the lookup tables. Lookup tables are just tables that, let's say for author, instead of writing an author name, I just have a table of authors with the ID and the name. So this is a lookup table. Ignore this one. Let's say we keep the author name in the books uh, table. Okay, so uh, don't use lookup tables, but the main tables that actually contain real data, how many tables would you use for this kind of application? 
and I created, um, Monica helped me to create a poll here. So let's try that. I've never tried that with GoToWebinar, but I'm going to lo launch the, the poll with a few different answers. So if you could, you know, choose the right answer or not the right, there is no right and wrong answer, but choose the, the number of tables that you would use. We'll give you, a, I don't know, I'll give you a few seconds to answer that and then uh, and then we'll try um, to answer that together. Okay, so the poll is on. And if you don't mind voting, we'll give a few seconds here. Okay, people started voting. Oh, interesting distribution. I'll, I'll tell you the results in a, in a minute. Okay, awesome. I can't see how many people voted. I just see percentage. Okay, so about 40% of you voted already. There's a definitely a winner. Okay, great. 45%, few more seconds. Oh, there's a question here. Are we doing an OLTP or a data warehouse design? I don't know, whatever you want. Okay, in the meantime, once you, oh, sorry. In the meantime, I have a, a couple of questions here, so let's answer them while you're still voting. Okay, so how about hybrid system? Yeah, uh, Anthony, thanks. I'm. I'm I, it was just an example to show people the differences between uh, different designs. So I didn't, I, I didn't actually want to talk about specific designs, but definitely hybrid systems are are very common these days. Um, okay, another question is from Richard. Uh, it's nice to see all TP and enterprise data warehouse discussion discussed. Uh, what is your schema design consideration for di data marts designed for specific? say departments uh just a few points would be great okay so let's let's discuss all these design and then we'll we'll talk about specific scenarios um some people say here it depends of course it depends um okay but i just wanted to to see how many of you think um how many tables would you need okay so let's close the poll Let's see if, I don't know if you can see the results, uh, but I'll tell you the results. Okay, so 18% of you said, oh, I can share that somehow. I just hit share poll for you. Oh, okay, so you did, thank you. Okay, so we have 18% said one table, 10% said two tables, three tables was the winner with 33% of you, and then four tables, so the, the the most of you said three or four tables which is it, it makes sense okay uh but we will talk about all of these 15 percent said five or more or more and actually i don't have an example with five or more so that's interesting um anyway okay so these was these were the results and let's hide that okay and let's continue so now after you voted let's talk about let's uh talk about the different options okay so i'll start with the one single table okay 18 percent of you decided to go with this design and many people when they when they think about you know designing a schema they go for you know three or four tables and i'll show these um soon which makes sense because this is the classical let's say rdbms design uh but in some cases a single table is is the right table and i'll just want to uh, i just want to explain how i i marked you know the color codes and and everything here so basically in these um designs that i'm going to show you the white columns are the common ones the five common one id type title date price and then um the colored ones are for uh, the specific product. So author and number of pages is for books, publication, publication and frequency for magazines and musician and number of tracks for audio. 
it's color coded yellow blue and uh, red and also i put in brackets uh the first letter so books b for books m for magazines and a for audio this is mainly because i got uh, uh i talked to people that are colorblind so they said ah hey, we can't see colors so i added the brackets here so um the single table the concept is to have just all the data in you know one table so by definition some of the columns here will be null because for books we'll have author and number of pages but the publication frequency musician number of tracks will be null by definition and that's okay okay this is the design one table that includes all the data that we need um and let's talk about the pros and cons so first of all it's very simple and it's good performance why because once we get to the record that we are interested in we have all the information there we have all the information there we don't need to go with joins and and you know get information from other places and we have everything in the same table also if we want some something about you know a general thing like all the prices of all the products everything is there in the table right so uh the performance is good and the design is very simple the problem is is contention for example if we work with oltp and we want to change only you know some things or um uh yeah we want to change only some things or we we access this table a lot because obviously this one table and the entire application access this table we will get hot blocks and this is with with a with a um many concurrent users as long as you don't have you know huge amount of users you'll be fine but as as the number of users goes goes up we will have we might start have a problem with you know internal contention on the specific blocks of this table um also if we want to change or we have a problem with one product let's say we have a problem with magazines okay and we need to do some let's say maintenance maintenance on that that's affecting everything because books and magazines and audio is all in the same table if i need to do something for this table with this table i affect all the products and also unnecessary scan of irrelevant data let's say i want to i don't know query all the books in in my store okay because everything is in the same table i will scan magazines or or say audio cds as well if i need to do a full table scan on books i will do full table scan on everything okay so i will scan irrelevant data things that i don't need so that's you know that's a um, a downside of this design the next design will be three tables so that was the uh, the most popular um in the poll so with three tables it's again very straightforward we'll have a table for books we'll have a table for magazines we'll have a table for audio okay each table will have the five common um attributes or properties and then the the two unique okay very simple pros and cons again very simple very straightforward good relatively good performance because when we again when we uh, want to get a specific book we go to the books table we get the specific book and we have the record okay we don't need to join anything we don't need to go to any other table we we just have it so the performance here will be uh good um when we access a relevant a specific product for example we want to unlike the the previous design we want to scan all the books in this case we will scan only the books we won't go to any other products okay so that's a benefit here unlike the previous design also if we want to change the structure of one product or we want to perform some maintenance on one of the tables it won't affect any other product right if i'm doing something on the magazine table it might affect magazines but not books or audio we won't have null value null columns so this is not really a problem but um like in the previous design it's not really a problem to have null values but again this is a very very simplified scenario okay so in real life when we have a uh, lot of data that we need to put in the tables 
a wide table might lead to some issues. Um, and if it's only 10 columns when, I don't know, four of them are might be now, that's not a problem. But once a table grows more than, if I remember correctly, 255 columns or something like that, like very wide table, lots of columns, there are some limitations or not really limitations, but some, some issues with tables like that. So if we have less columns, that might be beneficial. Also, these null columns, they do take up take up some space. Not a lot, but they do take, take up a little bit of space um, if they're in the middle of the table, not at the end. So, uh, so having this design with three tables, less null columns, so we don't have these problems with, with uh, lots of nulls that taking up space, or uh, which is not a big deal, but definitely um, not wide very wide tables so that's that's great uh however there are downsides as well if we want to add another product we will need to have another table and then you know change everything to use a new table also if we want to querying to query all products like i want to get uh, i would like to get a list of all the products that cost less than five dollars in this case, in the previous scenario, it was uh, uh, in the previous design, it was really, really easy. I have one table and it's one query. Here, I have three tables. I need to, um, I need to query all three tables, right, um, with the same query. So that's not great. And if I now add another product, I need to change this query to access four tables now, okay? And also, if I have views that you know do that union between all the tables or something like that these views i need to rewrite the views when i add another product okay um and last thing is if i search for an item with unknown type i know the title but i don't know which type it is okay so i need to in this case query three tables or a view that union all three tables but you know in in fact it, it queries three tables separately Okay, and if I have many different products, it will be a you know a bigger problem. So this is the three table design. Okay, let's move to the next one, four table design. So this is uh, this is usually the one the, the three and the four table is usually the design that I see with most uh, polls that I I do with this session. Uh, and that makes sense because this is, you know, the classical RDBMS design. So in four tables, the design will be that. Tables with items. So the common table, the common properties of everything will be in the items table. And then the unique properties will be in three different tables. Okay, books, audio, and magazines. And there will be a foreign key between the, the, the specific products, the books, audio, and magazines, into the items okay so in total we have four tables here items with the common properties and then three for the three different products let's talk about pros and cons here again this is very classic and straightforward rdbms design okay um it's very simple to summarize common common properties so for example summarize or or querying let's say I would like to get all the um, all the products that cost five dollars or less. I can do that with one query on the items table, and I have all the information. Okay, search for an item with unknown type. That's easy. I have the title. I don't know which type it is. That's easy. I have that in the items table. One query, and I have the data. Okay. However, the downsides again. Uh, I'll start with the last one, adding another product. If I want to add another product, I need to add another table, another join, change the application logic a little bit, and you know, not just say, oh, we have another product, this is the name of the product, this is the name of the columns, and that's it. I will we'll need to, to make, change more things in the application side. Um, and queries require more joins. Now, don't get me wrong, joins are excellent, and this is the, you know, in the core of, of any relational database. But as you go and make your schema more complex and require more joins, this can lead to some performance issues and the complexity of writing queries. 
okay? So joins per se are not bad thing, but lots of them might lead to some issues, okay? So this is the first actual uh, design that requires join. And if you think about the real case scenario, we'll, you'll have many more tables and you'll have all the lookups and, and you know, and many other things. So um, this is also something to think about, how many joins I will need to use in my queries, because I, I've seen queries that join like 20 tables. And that is really difficult to figure out if you have the performance problem, to try to analyze that. That's that's a complex thing. And it's a mess. And and you know, it's a it's a huge query. So you need to figure out if you if you added all the joins between the right tables and you didn't miss any uh predicate or anything like that. Okay. So this is also again, joins are in inherent part um of the inherent part of the of the RDBMS design. That's fine. But you need to consider how many will you need and how much you're going to split the tables um, and make it more complex design. Okay, uh, so as as long as you split more tables, you will have more complex design, unlike the the first two, which were very simple and straightforward. Okay. Um, Yeah, there is a comment here about four tables, this design, that will need constraints as well, right? We'll need uh, constraints, foreign keys between the between the child tables, the book audio, books, audio, and magazine, to the items table. That's correct. Okay. And the last, almost the last design, is two tables, okay? Which got the, the lowest score, from you, and this is uh, the design, and this is completely different than any other things that we, we saw today, okay? So in this case, we'll have two tables. One is the item tables, and one is the properties table. And we have the items table like in the four table design, so we have all the common properties here, okay? And the properties will include the properties table, props, will include all the properties of every object, okay? And just to make it clear, every property will have a different row in this table. So if I'm looking at book, a book, let's say ID number one, I don't know if you see my, my cursor, uh, I don't know if I have somewhere to highlight that, but I hope you see my cursor. So um id number one is the two first rows here this is the book it has author author and it has number of pages and the value for author is stephen king and the number of pages is seven thousand pages because if you read stephen king you know that his books are about seven thousand pages and uh id2 is uh an audio cd and the musician is pink okay so every property will have one row in this table, okay? So that's a bit different than what we saw until now. Let's talk about pros and cons. First of all, amazing flexibility, okay? You want to add another product, you want to add another property to existing product. Everything is done on the fly without changing, without even changing the structure of the table, okay? We can do anything we want on the fly online. Okay, so the entire structure is completely flexible. The downside is enforcing constraints. How do you con how do you enforce anything here? For example, um, here number of pages needs to be a number, or a specific value, or larger than zero, or something like that. How do I enforce that? Also, the data types. Okay, the author is text. The number of pages is number. Musician is text, maybe we'll have date as well. It's really difficult to have different data types here. So in some cases that I've seen, they have prop value varkar, prop value string um, number, and prop value date. But that makes everything even more complex. So you need to know the 
a data type in, in order to get to the, the to go to the, the right column and so on. Okay, so it's very uh, uh, complex with different data data types and and enforcing constraints, data integrity, and and the values itself themselves. Uh, and also, have you tried querying something something like that? So let's look at a few queries. So a simple query would be a specific author. Okay, so a specific author will be. I'm go, I'm looking at the inner query here select ID from props where the prop name is author and the prop value is Stephen King. I get all the ideas IDs of all the products they they have author and Stephen King, which is great because this is only books. And then we can go to items and query type equal books in case we have authors in some other type. And the ID is in the list of the IDs that we got from the props table. So this is Pretty much straightforward. I can see a question here. I'll answer it in a in a little while after the queries example. The next example is a bit more crazy or a bit crazier. Uh, when we look for a specific author or number of pages. In this case, it's not too bad, but it's a, it's it's a bit more tricky. So we get the all the IDs from the props table where the prop name the the pair of prop name and prop value is either author Stephen King or number pages and 7000. Okay, so in this case, I'll get all the IDs of objects that have author Stephen King or number of pages 7000. And then we go to the book to the items table and query everything from there. Okay, the real problem. Is what happens if you want author and number of pages and this is really difficult because the props table have uh has one row for each property so i can't really have end pretty uh, predicate on that okay so what i have what i did in this case is i queried like before i queried all the prop all the the rows that have author Stephen King and, or number of pages 700, 7,000. And then I got all the IDs and then I did a group by and I asked for all the IDs that have two rows, meaning they have both author Stephen King and number of pages 7,000. And with this list of IDs, I went to the items table. And think about more complex scenarios where you have both and and or, or you have a more than or less than value, or you know dates or something like that. This is really, really insane in this case. Okay, but this is this is a, a valid valid design. Okay, before we go to the last one, I have a question here. Uh, beginning of the session, we discussed about table design. So my question is, are we saying having null is better than having default values like minus one, N, A, et cetera. Yes, I, I believe so. Okay, so uh, if minus one or not available means something, that's great. So have that, like, I don't know, status is zero is closed and one is open and two is in process or something like that. If there is, if there is a, um, a reason or, um, um, logic behind this value um then yes use this value but if you just put uh minus one instead of null you mean null you mean unavailable you mean i have i don't have data but you add minus one instead um the, it's it's it might lead to a, to a few problems yes and uh it's it's generally it's not recommended um, and you can look for that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, blog posts. Uh, Chris Saxon talks a lot about that, and and Connor McDonald. They have uh, sessions about that, or they have blog posts about that. So definitely go there and um, and check that out. Okay, uh, because these values, uh, when they are not, when they don't mean anything, they might confuse the optimizer in some cases, uh, and they might confuse other applications as well. So I wouldn't recommend that. 
Okay, so let's go for the last uh, design. And that's one table, but a different one. Okay, so a single table that has all the five common uh, properties and then other info, which is a JSON. And the JSON is, is uh, uh, the JSON contains all the extra information that you need. Okay, so basically, um, you can ha have that author and number of pages. You can have their uh, I don't know musician and, and number of tracks or anything that you'd like. And this is uh, lately we see that more and more often because developers like using that. JSON is very easy. They they are familiar with that, so it's really easy for them to work with JSON and then process it in the application. And it's extremely flexible by definition. So we can have we can add more uh, products and more properties without any problem. The problem is that it's not really RDBMS. So in some cases, a JSON in the database would be beneficial. In some cases, it won't. Okay. So we cannot enforce anything by design. Um, we cannot have any constraint or check data integrity. It's it we can with with triggers, but it will be uh, much more difficult and much more problematic to do that. And it's not really an RDBMS design. Okay, so again, in some cases, if you want, if there is like free text uh, or, you know, additional information uh, that is by definition unstructured, by all means, use, a, use JSON. If it's the basic design of the application or the basic design of the table, uh, I wouldn't recommend that, but that's definitely an option, okay? Uh, and just as an example, JSON query with Oracle, with the JSON data type, it's really easy. Okay, so you just go to other info dot author equals Stephen King and that's it. Oracle can extract that, you can index that, and that's perfect. Okay, so um, we covered the one, two, three, four uh, different number of tables in, in our designs and, and we um, discuss the pros and cons of each and every one of them. Again, five and more, I don't have design with five or more tables. If you have, please feel free to, to send it to me or, or uh, I don't know, um, write that in, in the chat or the questions and we can discuss that. Um, so just to sum it up, which one is better? Which one is the best? And obviously the answer is it depends. And it depends on, on everything that we just talked about. Performance, flexibility, data integrity, querying, and space requirements. Okay, and I'll just give you an example before, uh, before we finish, uh, that um, me and one of my colleagues, uh, it was uh, quite a few years ago, but we had, we talked about, about design for a new feature. He's, him with his client and, and their application and me with my client. We, we were both consultants in the same company and uh, he had his own client, I had my own, and we both faced the same uh, question at the same time and we discussed that. And I had a requirement for adding a feature or adding some information into, into our design. He had the same and we both talked about different designs. Uh, and what would be best and we both we, we chose each chose um, with their client chose a completely different design okay so I chose the one table the first one that I showed you I can go back and show you and show you sorry just a second okay so I basically chose ah, it's a bit slow <clears throat> I, I basically chose this one okay why because we had a, um, it was an, an appliance type of, a type of application. So we shipped our application inside a, a server to the client. So the appliance was very, very uh, weak, let's say, not powerful server. Um, so the IO was very slow and the CPU is only one CPU or something like that. Uh, so we, we had very limited resources. Um, and we wanted everything to be in the same space. So once we get to the row, we wanted to have all the data. So we had like, I don't remember even, maybe 10 columns with all the data. Some of them were null by definition, some of them were not. Uh, but we wanted, once we run the query, 
as few joins as possible, we get to the row and we have all the data and that's it. Because we couldn't spend more CPU cycles and I.O. Uh, to perform more joins and get some more data. So we chose this design. Him on the other side with their, with his client, they choose this design, okay? And their um, incentive was that they didn't want to change anything with the table structure once everything is up and running, okay? So once the application is live, they didn't want to touch the tables, they didn't want to touch the structure, they didn't want to add columns or anything like that. They wanted a complete flexibility from the database point of view. Everything was handled in the application. So they went for this, uh, this design. I hope they didn't need to do you know, complex queries because this is, this is a pain, but, but this is what they decided to go for. Okay, so basically, yes, it depends, but basically what you need to figure out is the requirement of your application, your limitations, um, and your restrictions or whatever, and based on all of that, you can go and choose the, the correct design for your specific case and application, okay? And I have another example here, but we don't really have time. So, um, so I, I, I have that in the, in the presentation, and uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me later because we, we are out of time. So I hope I have a couple of uh, minutes to just uh, answer, answer a few questions. And I leave this uh, slide here if you want to, you know, save my information, contact information, and keep in touch. So let's see, I have two questions here. Will this video will be available? I don't know about the video, this, the slides will be available, I guess the video as well, but that's for uh, maybe Coleman and, and Monica to answer. Um, and last question, you're going to touch base on data mod design guidelines in this discussion. No, I'm, I'm not. Okay, I didn't, I mentioned all TPN data warehouse at the beginning, just as an example, okay? Today, hybrid applications are much more common than a pure data mart or data warehouse versus OLTP. So in your specific case, you will need to take all of this into consideration and then think in what aspect of the application you will need to get more performance with questions or with the querying or with inserting and uh, you know the flexibility and the integrity and and the um, and the type of queries and space if you have limitation on that so um for every aspect of the application even data mart sometimes have some aspects that are more oltp like um and you will need to or you will want to um have more normalized data there and some aspects are not and some uh, applications are are hybrid so i'm not going to talk about specific uh, type of applications, uh, but as a general, you know, information and for each and every case that you have, you can, you know, uh, discuss that with with the with the users, with the with the developers, and and decide which which method or which design will be the best for you. And I see that Coleman answered that the video will be available on the website of uh, nyoug.org. Uh, and I think that's it. So if you have any more questions, uh, you can type them or I don't know if we have time. But anyway, thank you very much for joining me.